I'm, I'm really excited to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing and, um, you know, thinking about quantum matter, in particular quantum matter that is illuminated and under various types of excitation, how we can describe the behavior of a plus system. I, uh, before I, I dive into the science, I just want to acknowledge the students and postdocs who worked with me on these topics, uh, some of whom have gone on to start their own groups. And uh, I, I hope that uh, some of you will consider sending your students and postdocs over to, to my group. So, you know, we think about how we can describe some of these quantum systems and, and to a, a theory audience, I don't uh, need to uh, belabor this too much, but just to say that we combine ideas in quantum electrodynamics and thinking about correlated electronic structure, as well as more recently, how we can intersect these with open systems methods and uh, possibly leverage both quantum and classical resources in order to simulate that systems. A really nice talks early in the week uh, describing hybrid quantum classical algorithms. I think this area is uh, are really taking off. And I think open systems uh, approaches, particularly those that allow us to map uh, larger problems onto quantum devices than you could previously uh, is an area of interest. Certainly, um, you know, when we think about these, you know, question that I, I get frequently is, you know, well, how are you, you know, merging across these methods? Is there a single method that you use? And the obvious answer is no, there isn't. In fact, we think about how we can take the best of both quantum chemistry and condensed matter approaches uh, to describe various systems. So, so many of you have seen various versions of this slide before, and I wanna dive into two examples where there is both the need for combining across uh, quantum chemistry and uh, condensed matter approaches, and also where um, it, it sometimes uh, poses challenges. The first example is the case of thinking about various um, qubits, in, in particular um, spin qubits that are hosted in, in um, solid state systems, could be a low dimensional system, could be uh, diamond, silicon carbide, HVN, pick your favorite system. And it turns out that this is actually a really, really uh, interesting and, and uh, a fun area to merge different methods. So I'm using my hands in a with, with the combination of, of the slides, so hopefully you can, can uh, see both. So typically when we, we think about a single qubit, uh, you're, you're thinking about a, a single qubit space. Perhaps it's a, um, you're using the, the electronic spin here and, and there's been a lot of emphasis, of course, in describing such optically active uh, defects in, in solids. Of course, when you start thinking about combining it with another uh, qubit, which is necessary, thinking about actually entangling these, thinking about how these would actually uh, be initialized and what would a readout scheme look like, and how do those things, right, very much uh, confirmation concepts uh, translate into um, materials or, or uh, quantum chemistry parameters that we can get from our calculations. So I think there's uh, a lot to be done here. I will uh, give you at least one example today, uh, especially when we talk about cavities and molecules and cavities, how uh, two molecules and two different cavities can be entangled and how you can actually think about establishing that uh, they're, they are truly entangled. So characterizing entanglement in such systems is actually quite exciting. And uh, this is something I'm going to uh, come back to in, in a few slides. Um, a separate genre of, of uh, cases where also we have noticed that there is a need to combine across quantum chemistry and condensed matter, a totally different regime, is when you're strongly driving the system, right? So thinking about a few photon limit, which is really what we're thinking about you know, when it comes to um, quantum technologies, you're, you might have zero or, or a few photons or a few phonons. Um, when you think about strongly driving system, you're in a totally different limit where you're actually um, you know, pumping in as many photons or a lot of energy into the system. This is another case where I think they're, and, and as different as it may seem, uh, to actually um, bring in new methods across quantum chemistry and materials physics. It could be in the context of actually probing the system or actually creating new states by driving. And uh, when I say broad spectral band, I truly mean broad because it could be all the way from a microwave resonator, uh, some of the ideas that we're pursuing, for example, with Miri Kobe's group uh, to x techniques. And of course, you know, there is a, a lot that has happened uh, in, in the, both of those areas and uh, nonlinear to Hertz spectroscopy. Okay, so uh, let me uh, sharpen this a little bit and uh, put, put more color around it and say, what are we really talking about, right? So. Why is it so hard for me to just take, you know, your, your favorite quantum chemistry technique, your favorite technique in condensed matter and directly apply it to, to the problem? Well, um, so heuristically, if I was thinking it 
about it in, in terms of the potential IG surface and, and say some either lattice or electronic coordinate, when I'm in a regime of slightly probing, right? Life is good. Um, I could actually describe, uh, you know, what's happening to my system as a small perbation for, for the ground state. And a lot of techniques exist for describing correlated ground states. Um, you know, thinking about a couple cluster, uh, and of course, if you're you're now thinking about very very strongly correlated systems, perhaps uh, something on, on the lines of uh, DMRG. And there've been talks and ideas on that put forward by uh, various speakers in in this uh, long program. Things get a little more interesting when you're talking about switching. Uh, could be between degenerate ground states or something that is kind of stable. Um, in such situations, if you if you start to try and describe things using um, any any mean field theory or modifications of it, um, there there are challenges. Of course, we need to do that sometimes because otherwise we don't really have any approaches. Um, but but I think this presents uh, some some interesting question. Of course, critical phenomena and then also very very strongly nonlinear phenomena, particularly those that have been um, that have become possible with nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy. And I'm going to talk about some of these nonlinear phenomena where you can convert between different types of order parameters. I think there, there are some uh, fun questions to be answered from a theory standpoint there. Uh, so that brings me to, to the outline of my talk. Uh, and since I have about 40 minutes, I'll, I'll try and be efficient with my time. Uh, I want to cover first the regime where we're driving the system very far out of equilibrium, uh, particularly to control the magnetic order. This is work that I've not really talked about in, in um, uh, too many contexts. So, so those of you who've heard me give a talk over the last year and a half, this uh, this will be new. Um, and then the the second uh, part, I, I really want to emphasize in the work that we're doing in cavity control of um, nonlinear interactions, as well as cavity control of molecular qubits, and this problem of how can we actually describe entanglement across uh, cavities that that contain uh, these these molecular qubits, and what are some challenges associated with that, and perhaps where we can actually leverage existing techniques of quantum chemistry. So uh, with that, let me uh, dive right in. Um, so when we think about you know, these nonlinear interactions, I, like I said, I want to focus primarily on things that have been enabled by nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy, ones where we're actually using uh, the, the vibrational excitation to then uh, control some other order in the material. So this could be phonon-driven superconductivity. They've been uh, some very, very beautiful results on this, uh, phonon-driven ferroelectricity, or thinking about magnetically dressed uh, vibrational excitation. This is where you're interconverting between uh, the, the phonon and uh, either the, the a single or maybe even a, a multiple magnon uh, process. And finally, something that I won't get a chance to talk about here today, but is also of interest is you know, various uh, strain-driven uh, topological symmetry breaking. So essentially, uh, changing the, the phonons and, and thinking of that as a, a way of uh, switching the, the topology. There's also very interesting questions that have popped up in uh, that, that domain. So when we started thinking about it, we said, okay, um, had we actually accomplished the same thing with a phonon that, that you would expect to see, uh, particularly in, in um, various optical processes in controlling uh, the magnetic order? And of course, we're familiar with very many di different uh, optomagnetic processes that exist. In fact, um, you know, if you think about magneto-optic or optomagnetic effect, um, you can open a textbook and they essentially tell you about the interaction of light with the magnetic medium. And these, of course, prominent examples, Faraday, cotton Newton effects. And essentially you think of it as the, the transmission of light is modified through a medium uh, because of, of uh, uh, of, of this uh, uh, this effect. Um, you can also have the inverse of these effects, so inverse Faraday and the inverse cotton Newton effect, where you get an effective magnetic field for the spin in the material, right? And the word effective magnetic field here is very important um, because these are, are not real fields. And you'll see with some of the numbers that you can actually achieve with these fields that it's actually uh, quite high. Now, phenomenologically, right, you could say, well, all of those effects can be introduced if uh, I have a, uh, a phonon instead of a photon. So this is not an error I'm making of, of words, this is actually intentional, where I'm gonna replace opto with phono everywhere, okay? And so I'm gonna have magnetophononic and phonomagnetic effects that, that have uh, the same, um, in, in some ways, phenomenological behavior as, as photons, except that I have more selectivity now because which phonon is actually coupling is, is gonna be 
uh, different. And here are now the vibrational quanta uh, will, will take, take, take the place of our uh, photon, but uh, everything about the, the material here is, is going to be actually uh, very similar. And we're going to get effective fields that are generated. Um, and we're gonna look at, at essentially um, antiferromagnetic system. So which system am I gonna talk about? First, I'm gonna give you an example right, of uh, nickel oxide. By the way, the, the, on, on the left here are, are the optomagnetic uh, processes I'm talking about could be circularly polarized or linearly polarized light. And the, the equivalent uh, here of, of the phonons would be some, something that's uh, a chiral phonon or, or a phonon that is, is uh, polarized this way. And instead of my um, optical frequencies that are exciting, right? Uh, I'm going to now worry about the, the magnon, uh, the phonon and, and the magnon. Uh, energy. So, so uh, omega-1, uh, omega-2 corresponding to, to the photons, and of course the M0 corresponding to the magnons. So crucial to this mechanism on the left being uh, reflected on the right is, of course, a system where there is actually good uh, spin-photon coupling. So an antiferromagnet like uh, nickel oxide is a, is a good fruit fly. It's something that, uh, you know, there's a, a lot that's been uh, written about it. Uh, but perhaps it's not the most, um, the only material where this is possible. So, so let me uh, walk through it and, and tell you about, um, you know, first what we see in nickel oxide and then what we can actually do uh, theoretically to predict this in other systems where such effects have not yet been measured. Okay, so um, the, the Megiddo optical or optomagnetic Hamiltonians that, that I can write out, uh, primarily, you know, you'd be interested in actually figuring out the um, the coupling between the photon and, and the magnon there. Uh, in our case, now we're interested in the photomagnetic component, so we need to think about the spin photon coupling. Um, what we propose to, to leading order is that these uh, inverse photomagnetic effects actually um, are substantial, that now you're thinking about a coherent excitation, right? so it's a coherent uh, source exciting coherently the phonon, and it, it then allows the, the spins to start uh, processing. And, and this is actually uh, something that will coherently excite the magnon in the, the material. In this case, we're thinking of um, you know, something that's in the terahertz or mid IR. Um, and to, to first order, this is going to be the phonon inverse Faraday effect. And uh, going to second order in the magnetization, I'm going to get the uh, phonon inverse Cotton Newton effect. And these uh, effects, again, in, in terms of, of their Hamiltonians and how their Hamiltonians would be classified directly mirror what you see with the magneto-optic and optomagnetic effects. So um, now we can take spin photon coupling uh, that is observed for these systems, or we can try to, to predict that uh, ab initio. And just to put a little more color around this, this is work that was done by uh, Dr. Dominic Yurashek while he was in the group. He's now uh, started his own group at, on the faculty at uh, Tel Aviv University. So we think about the, the inverse Faraday effect, and this is essentially what the phonon inverse Faraday effect looks like um, with, heuristically, and we're going to be computing now the effective uh, quantum magnetic field. The first question we got when we said, you know, these effects exist, these effects are appreciable, was, well, um, how large are they really uh, relative to what you can get from the, the equivalent optomagnetic effect? And also a very interesting question of you're using an ultra fast pulse, uh, so at what point is this uh, picture of an effective magnetic uh, field, and I think about this as magnetic medium, actually a, a good approximation? So those are both questions that, that we're going to uh, dive into and, and sharpen even a little more over, over the next couple of slides. So nickel oxide, by no means the best material for doing this, uh, but it, it turns out that you can excite it. Um, a very nice, uh, you know, uh, 12 terahertz um, uh, phonon. And, and you get a phonon inverse Faraday effect that's about uh, a few amount of cells. It's not all that great, right? The, the equivalent um, system, similar excitation, uh, the inverse Faraday effect is, is tens of, of amount of cells. So you say, okay, maybe this effective magnetic field is not giving me everything I, I wanted. But like I pointed out, nickel oxide is our fruit fly. It's not the only system that we can look at. And in fact, when we go to a system like uh, the, the rare earth trihalides, in particular, cerium trichloride, we found a very different story. We found here uh, uh, an effective magnetic field that's 10 to the four times larger than what we see in nickel oxide, in part because of the unique structure of uh, such rare earth trihalides. 
and their 4F spin. So let me tell you uh, a little bit um, you know, ab about this, this system. I think serum trichloride is a very uh, uh, fun system. It's, it's, uh, it exists as a crystal. It's, it's been around for a while. I, I looked this up and, and turns out actually that you could, if you were so inspired, order a, a crystal of it uh, and, and have it delivered from <laughs> Sigma Aldrich. But it's also a whole family of these that have these four ferromagnetic spins uh, where you actually start to see these, uh, what we think are, are chiral uh, photon uh, effects. I want to point out that this is different from the work done in cobalt fluoride. There were very nice reports from um, Ankitiza and, and others from the uh, Andrea Cavallari group. Uh, so, so now we're actually thinking about something here that is an optically driven chiral phonon uh, in this uh, system that's then driving the 4F paramagnetic spin. So I made this point earlier about how you need a large spin photon coupling. And this is where that manifests. So, so it turns out that in order for these chiral photons um, to then um, directly interact with these uh, for, for a paramagnetic spins, you need just the right structure. In terms of serum trichloride, think of uh, you know, ethereum uh, surrounded by these chlorine ligands. And um, perhaps that's you know, at least my heuristic picture as you start moving the serum and then the, the chlorine start to, to move around it and uh, maybe slightly more mathematically, uh, here's, here's what the, the, the level structure looks like for it. So then the next question for us to be truly non-equilibrium here, by the way, was to actually figure out how does the, um, you know, when you, when you look at the, the um, spectral signatures and you actually try and do explicit time dynamics, what does this um, look like? And uh, the, the answer to that is, is as follows. So now we're, uh, we're tracking here the amplitude uh, with uh, respect to time. Time here is in picoseconds. I want to emphasize that it's ultra short, but it's not ultra, ultra short in the sense that in the picosecond time domain, it's okay for us to actually uh, make some of these approximations about this being an effective uh, magnetic medium. If we went to single femtosecond, that approximation uh, would start to break down. And there are two different uh, phonon uh, modes here, 5.9 and 4.8 terahertz. Uh, the incoming terahertz pulse here is in green, exciting first the uh, EU uh, and, and also the, um, the 4.8 uh, terahertz uh, mode. You start to see the effective magnetic fields. So, so exciting just the, the 5.9 uh, terahertz um, uh, phonon doesn't really do much for us, not really uh, getting anything in the effective magnetic fields here. Uh, this is an effective magnetic field in Tesla. This is a very large number. If you think about artificial magnetic fields that can be realized, even folks who are working on the AMO side have, have uh, uh, you know, barely gotten to, to such numbers. Um, and you contrast that now with the effective magnetic field that's generated with the 4.8 uh, terahertz mode. So clearly you can't do this with just any plain old mode. Uh, there are particular modes where you get this very large spin phonon coupling, where you actually get appreciable effective magnetic fields. And we've actually been able to do uh, also fluence dependent studies on these. So you're not driving the system so hard that you're, you're melting it. This is actually well within the ranges that you, you would actually expect from uh, an experimentalist in the field. So as we were doing this, what we wanted to do is, is compare what we see um, in, in terms of effective magnetic field that can be realized uh, with, with other systems and also the fluences that have been used. So uh, the top three results here are experiments that people have done and the um, bottom four are theory, including our work on serum trichloride. Um, and the top three, there's two on, on the optical uh, IFE and then the rest are all the phonon inverse uh, Faraday effect. What you see is serum trichloride substantially higher than nickel oxide, substantially higher than uh, potassium-based compounds, and even uh, some of these um, uh, dysporium and erbium-based uh, um, uh, compounds. So uh, we think that this has everything to do with this chiral phonon and this uh, 4F paramagnetic um, you know, spin that, that you see uh, the defective magnetic fields here can be truly giant. And uh, this is very reasonable fluences, especially when you compare with the fluences that people have actually uh, realized experimentally. And even our, our uh, pulse duration here is uh, fairly forgiving and uh, well within the approximations that we have made. So um, this strategy actually turns out to be uh, quite general. And uh, you, you ought to think of it as, okay, I have some crystal, maybe it's cobalt fluoride. 
uh, I can either go via the, the um, infrared resonant Brahman effect and then I'm left describing IR uh, active phonons that, and how they then uh, translate their energy into Raman active phonons. So this is essentially purely using the electric field component of this pulse, or I can think of the magnetic fields and, and things like the magnetic infrared uh, resonant Raman effect and, and actually exciting some of these magnons. So I wanna uh, dwell on that question uh, a little bit longer and say that you know, it doesn't have to be a single magnon that is excited. In fact, you can have uh, you know, both some frequency and difference frequency uh, processes associated with these uh, magnons. You can have magnon magnon interactions, and this is so you can have a one magnon or, or a two magnon process that is actually uh, mediating the, um, the, the translation of, of this uh, incoming uh, probe, this very well selected phonon, uh, and, and the uh, magnetic response that, that you see in the system. So the idea is uh, here again. Uh, to, to have you know, various uh, different frequencies and frequency processes uh, find their phonomagnetic analog. And, um, and in, in, in some cases, try and figure out, you know, are you talking about uh, essentially a, a difference frequency or some frequency magnon process? And where there are cases where you can have uh, magnon magnon scattering. Uh, evaluating uh, ab initio, this magnon magnon scattering matrix element is something that we're working on. We're also trying to figure out how such a matrix thinking about the, the magnon magnon uh, scattering matrix element can then enter uh, calculations of uh, magnon transport and how perhaps that might have similarities or differences with other work that we've done in transport. I won't get a chance to talk about that here today, uh, but, but if you're interested, uh, please feel free to uh, ask me about it. And I hope we can get a chance to also discuss it in, in person. So for the next few minutes, I wanna switch gears and talk about a different way of controlling matter and molecules. And this is now using a cavity. At the, the very uh, start of my talk, I mentioned that you know, these are essentially uh, analogous processes in terms of the, the questions they bring up, uh, particularly when we start to think about actually observables that are, are of interest to us. So I talked about the need for new methods. There were other talks uh, earlier this week on approaches that have been introduced in QED plus electronic structure theory. Um, I want to emphasize that you know, QED plus uh, time-dependent density function theory or other QED and mean field methods are in many ways, uh, you know, helpful, but, but also not sufficient to, cal uh, to, to capture uh, some of the, the more interesting intermolecular physics going on or to even calculate and, and predict uh, some of these uh, other you know, cavity mediated entanglement of molecular qubits that, that we're interested in. So uh, towards that, you know, when we've been thinking about these uh, molecules in, in a cavity, now we're, we're really uh, getting to, to something interesting, right? We, we are interested in trying to figure out if you come in with, uh, say, an, an entangled photon, uh, entangled light, uh, it's interacting with two spatially separated cavities that each contain uh, a molecular qubit. Uh, for now, you could think of it as being this very, very simple molecule, though, of course, this isn't exactly the electronic structure or, or crystal structure, I'm sorry, of a, uh, a real molecular qubit. Uh, your coherent right and light uh, and, and the two-mode squeeze vacuum right, is now going to impart uh, this entanglement onto to the, the molecule. And so far, we've been formulating this problem in uh, a length gauge Hamiltonian. Uh, we, can, we can debate that if, if there is uh, interest and in, in time. And, and thinking about how either these cavities could be optical cavities, or even if they are um, you know, phononic or, or surface acoustical wave-based uh, cavities, how would you actually uh, excite them and then uh, describe this entanglement across the, the uh, two cavities? And this is a question that I think um, now, now brings to, to the fore a, um, a related question. Right? I can do this entire thing either in a discrete variable or a continuous variable entanglement. So I'm coming in with my Gaussian beam, and uh, this is now, when I'm thinking about this uh, gas entanglement, right, I'm coming in with something that is continuous variable. Um, and I've been able to think about this initial entangled state between the two uh, laser beams, just heuristically speaking, uh, that is transferred now to the vibrational modes of, of the molecules. Um, you could transfer it to electronic modes. I want to focus this explicitly here on the, the vibrational modes because I think there are some interesting questions here, uh, particularly. If you think about the uh, discrete variable entanglement, which refers essentially now to the 
uh, vibrational modes of each molecule that, that are excited and um, how, how you can convert from CV to DV. Or if you stay within uh, the continuous variable entanglement, then uh, we would be now referring to the, the coordinates, the position and momentum of each molecule while, while they're in that uh, cavity. Okay, so, so to take this question even further, you know, uh, we're talking about the very, very well-defined uh, vibration modes. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how explicitly they're, they're entangled with each other. Uh, but in order to actually say that they are entangled with each other, I need to, to uh, describe what the, um, what the entanglement measures here would be. And this is where rubber hits the road because um, you, know, you, you can, with some interesting quantumography, uh, you can reconstruct the, the uh, density matrices here and perhaps you can talk about um, the, the entanglement uh, in, in that way. Uh, but even then you have three options. The simplest option, and this is the one that is um, invoked quite, quite frequently, uh, you might you might be familiar with this from also a, a textbook understanding of, of such systems is the a negativity. So this comes primarily from the uh, Paris Hardiki uh, bound, and and you can actually think about the uh, to to what extent the PPT separability criteria is violated. Okay, um, and so all all I have to do in order to do this is actually get uh, the density matrices that correspond to uh, these two molecular qubits and and talk about uh, uh, the entanglement in that way. I think something that's even more exciting than that is thinking about the entanglement of formation uh, in, in part because this also gives me a way of bounding how uh, distilled my entanglement could be should I start to think about these molecules in a cavity essentially as, as becoming a building block uh, for, for a quantum memory. And entanglement of formation then gives me the amount of maximally entangled, maximally entangled states that are needed for, for creation of, of uh, a mixed state. And finally, I can also think about something that's maybe a little bit um, more physical is this relative entropy of entanglement, which now is a distance-based uh, entanglement measure. Uh, and it's referring to the distance between the entangled state uh, from, from a, a closely separable state that you can construct using uh, that same system. So now what we're thinking about, and this is um, unpublished work, but I wanted to share that with the distinguished audience here, you know, how can we take these entanglement measures, figure out the vibrational modes of a real molecule that is being thought of as a molecular qubit, and either in discrete variable or continuous variable, uh, just figure out the, the um, maximally distillable entanglement that you could get out of such a system. So what I like about these entanglement measures is that you can get both lower and upper bounds that are justifiable and, and rigorous, and this could be actually one of the ways to take some of the work that's being done on molecules and cavities and apply it to the, uh, the field of, of uh, quantum technology. Okay, so the, the more mainstream way that people think about matter in cavities has been to, to think about changes to uh, reactivity, to, to think about energy transfer. And most recently, we've been thinking about how this could have an impact on phase transitions. And there's a set of papers that we're working on together with the uh, group of uh, Henrik Koch uh, and, and Ming Chen. Um, and the work here is now being led by one of my postdocs, uh, John Philbin, uh, together with Tor Hogland, a student working with Hendrik. And this is where we realized very quickly that when you think about molecules and cavities, particularly modifications to various intermolecular interactions, the van der Waals, the uh, dipole-induced dipole, or, or other types of interactions, you, you ought to really um, go to a higher level of theory than a, a mean field theory. So, uh, you know, we've been now thinking about QED plus couple cluster and QED and, and uh, full configuration interaction for, for such cases. Though, when you think about many molecules, there is an additional complication that treating many molecules explicitly is hard. This is where Ming Chen's expertise in um, actually thinking about uh, MD and, and uh, coming up with uh, fitted pair potentials has been invaluable. I'm not an expert in molecular dynamics, so I'm going to uh, not dwell on that and, and just defer any questions to. To, to me. So what we've seen so far is that if you have, um, you know, say hydrogen uh, molecules, these are the simplest case we could construct. Think about intermolecular interactions in, in such a case. Um, there is a substantial difference between the cavity and the no cavity case. Um, and, and it's uh, very visible if you look at the 
uh, Leonard Jones type potential here. So this is the no cavity case here in, in red. And here is the, the case where we have a fairly uh, a strongly coupled cavity to a, a set of molecules. And the first thing we see, this is a, a new result first presented uh, by, by us at, at the APS meeting a couple of weeks ago, is that these hydrogen molecules in a cavity via this intermolecular interaction start to order while they're, uh, when, when you put them in a cavity. So it's almost thinking of it as um, practically a, a phase transition. So things go from being uh, practically you know, uh, randomly aligned to, to you start to see an actual ordering that is happening in the cavity. And so we, we were interested in that. There are two aspects here, right? There's the change from the cavity introduced in the fundamental forces, and secondarily, uh, a change from the cavity introduced in, in, the, uh, uh, in the ensemble, the, the stat neck picture of, of what is going on. Um, we can intuit it with uh, some of the uh, you know, perturbation theory results. Of course, perturbation theory goes a long way, but it also doesn't go all the way, uh, which is the whole reason to do some of these calculations. Um, but, but it gives us kind of an understanding of why uh, in, in the cavity, we start to see ordering between uh, the, the, um, the, the hydrogen molecules that are sitting. Uh, of course, hydrogen is exciting, but um, you know, something with a, a permanent dipole would be even more exciting. Uh, so, so we've been thinking about things like the water molecule and, and what that would do here. Um, in part because looking at a phase transition would be, which is modified by such strong coupling would actually be quite exciting. So um, look out for, for a, a paper from us on the archive on this topic in uh, the, the next few, few weeks. So um, now I wanna switch gears a little bit and tell you about something else that you could accomplish in a cavity that we've recently reported that you could not do uh, any other way. And this is uh, headed back in the, the direction of nonlinearities and controlling various nonlinear processes. So uh, we're all familiar with the, the fact that nonlinear processes uh, in, in central symmetric systems, you shouldn't get really a, a chi two or, or a chi four, the second and fourth order should be suppressed. However, what we realized is that by strong coupling to the cavity, you can actually induce such a symmetry breaking. You could actually get these nonlinear optical processes to go in, in such a coupled system. And now going back to a length gauge uh, Hamiltonian here, uh, you see the, the, um, the term that is modified. This is the term where the symmetry is actually broken, right? So the, the let me take a step back. Sorry, I, I skipped something here. Um, in order to, to think about such a central symmetric system, we picked a model system, something with rigorously one uh, effective uh, electron, which is a 2D semiconductor ring made of gallium arsenide. It's, it's just our model system. This is my strategy with pretty much everything. Pick a fruit fly first, then pick something that's a real organism. Um, and in, in such a 2D semiconductor ring, there is no, it's a central symmetric system. You don't expect a, a chi2 uh, process to, to go, okay? What you realize is that in, in this term here, um, the, the dipole self energy essentially gives us an additional harmonic binding potential. And, and there's a, a bilinear interaction term that then breaks the symmetry of, of this uh, of quantum break. Now we have coupled here to a specific polarization uh, of, of the cavity mode between this uh, semiconductor ring and the cavity. And that itself presents some interesting options, right? So I can think of either uh, switching the cavity on or off, or I could even think of tuning the coupling to then get um, a very, very tunable uh, nonlinearity in, in the system. So uh, I think this is a, this is a general prescription and we now mechanistically understand where such a cavity induced symmetry breaking comes into the picture. So uh, this work is, is on the archive. Uh, it's being led by uh, David Wallach, uh, a postdoc in the group. So taking that a step further, we thought about this tunability and said, can you get efficient high harmonic generation from a strongly coupled light matter system? And you know, before I go to some, some very, very high harmonic, maybe I can start with uh, second harmonic and third harmonic generation and see how it's modified in a photon mode is, is uh, resonantly coupled to the matter excitation. And in this case, we also have a fruit fly system. I keep emphasizing these are fruit flies because uh, this is the very first question I get uh, after I, I finish the talk, you know, can you do this in my system, insert system here? So yes, likely, but today let's just think about um, this, this very simple azulene uh, molecule sitting in a cavity. 
uh, and, and look at the second harmonic spectra as you increase light matter coupling. So first case, lambda zero, no light matter coupling. Then you get a lambda 0.01, it's moderate. Some, some strong coupling, you start to see harmonic generation ready and very uh, a significant uh, second harmonic generation uh, when, when you go to a, a regime of strong coupling of lambda being 0.05. These cavities, um, while drawn as Fabry Perot, in fact, uh, terahertz cavities are, are better suited for, for uh, such a situation and uh, would allow you, you know, um, more, more access to uh, such har harmonic uh, spectra. So uh, in the context of uh, you know, where we are taking this uh, theoretically, uh, we're, we're thinking about you know, if, if there are um, molecules, for example, the, the GNRs that could be uh, graphene-like nanorubbins that, that could sit in these molecules. They're not that different from azulene. Of course, they're substantially more complex and have more uh, functional groups and, and all that good stuff. If you could actually control such high harmonic generation and uh, start to see you know, interesting uh, nonlinear phenomena, uh, there's a link between this and the molecular qubit work because I think uh, us and, and others have been talking about uh, GNRs being, uh, you know, possibilities for for uh, molecular qubits. In fact, I uh, recently uh, funded Muri in in our group together with Jeremy Levy is, is focused exactly on showing that a GNR Base qubit uh, is is a, a functioning molecular qubit. Uh, so you could think of actually combining these ideas of you know um, molecules across two cavities that are entangled with each other, or perhaps um, even molecules within within uh, the, the same cavity where you're using the cavity mode. Uh, but perhaps you're you're also accessing some of the uh, nonlinear um, uh, excitation. The, the, uh, optical nonlinearities in the system. So I think there's uh, plenty to, to do here and um, plenty uh, uh, more, more to come. Um, so, so with that, and I see I'm at the, the uh, top of my, my time and, and hour here, when I just summarize, you know, I started by telling you about some of the nonlinear interactions where you're driving the system, uh, particularly some of our new results in controlling the magnetic order that way. And um, then I, I switch gears to tell you about cavity control of, of molecules, both for making molecular qubits and controlling uh, nonlinearities and intermolecular interactions. I want to thank funding. I'm especially grateful to the Department of Energy uh, for, for allowing us to essentially calculate endlessly on uh, the NERSC and uh, the, the Oak Ridge Summit uh, supercomputers. And thank you for your attention. Thank you to my group and happy to take questions.